You're in a different world on How Do I Know You. Don Lewis is a multi-talented and multifaceted award-winning individual. A trumpet award, Grammy award-winning singer, multiple NAACP image awards, BMI and ASCAP award-winning songwriter, film, television, and stage actor, a series TV creator slash producer, and an inductee into the Women's Songwriters Hall of Fame 2021. Her early career includes being an original cast member of Hanging with Mr. Cooper and the groundbreaking series A Different World. She was also composer of the show's theme song. Dawn's most recent projects include the original Broadway cast of Tina, the Tina Turner Musical, a special appearance on 911, and a recurring role in the award-winning series Grey's Anatomy. Currently, she can be heard on several animated series, including Star Trek Lower Decks, Futurama, The Simpsons, and Karma's World. She was added this season to the cast of the hit series Young Rock starring Dwayne Johnson, as well as to the reboot of the fan favorite Veronica Mars. Dawn is the president and CEO of Morning Jewel Inc., a multi-platform production company of film, television, animation, music, and music publishing projects. She is also the founder and CEO of the A New Day Foundation, a nonprofit organization whose mission is to provide empowerment and programmatic support to underserved youth and communities across the country and abroad. In 2019, Dawn received an honorary doctorate in humane letters for her more than 35 years of unwavering service and support to underserved youth and communities. Dawn serves on several boards and is a spokesperson for a variety of organizations, such as the National Advisory Board of the National Center for Civil and Human Rights, the SAG-AFTRA National Board of Directors, the KIS Foundation for Sickle Cell Disease, UNCF, American Heart Association, American Cancer Society, and the Empower Her Institute. Dawn also finds time to teach master classes, mentor youth, and give motivational lectures. gentleman's voice over that introduction told you all you need to know about this dynamic lady my friend our guest today for how do i know you Woo! i love this world so let's bring don in without further ado my sister don lewis hi carl how are you <laughs> Do we even need to do an interview now? We're done, right? We're I know. That <laughs> intro just basically spelled everything out about your your dynamic and full, uh, your accomplishments. I mean, just, I mean, I talk to a lot of people on this thing and a lot of people are doing some great things, but your stuff is so diverse. Thank you. Thank and you. so well, accomplished. I didn't tell everything, but it, it definitely told a lot. It did. It definitely told a lot. Is there, there's more? Oh, 
yeah, man, <laughs> nobody just shows up on television. At least nobody I know. I know. I know. No, I've been performing professionally since I was about 14 years old. I was lead singer in a band. Mm -hmm. So we used to do, you know, proms, different concerts, community mm -hmm. events, and then going to the high school of music and art. I played cello for seven years, mm -hmm. went down to the University of Miami, and I had been dancing since I was about seven. So I went to the U and I was there as an applied voice major, having just come from the High School of Music and Art, a fame fame. So I was classically trained with sight reading, sight singing, opera, all of those things. And so when I went to school in Miami, I was only 16 when I started college. Right. Uh, the degree program, the applied voice program was basically for classically trained singers. But I had already been doing so much. I've been singing R&B, yeah, I've been dancing, I've been acting. So I kind of erased half of the classes that I was required to take for my major because I had already taken them. I wasn't going to go back and I said, I already had these classes in high school. I'm going to take, take taking them again. So I wrote in the classes I wanted to take. I wrote in acting classes, dancing classes, jazz, vocal, all these other things. And uh, I got called into the dean's office. Uh, I was there for about four weeks and got called into the dean's office and wow. got a speech saying, young lady, we were reluctant to admit you because you're so young, but the one thing you can't do is come here and not go to class. <laughs> <laughs> we're acing everything. She said, well, yeah, this class, this class, and this class. Oh, I'm not in that class. I've been in this class, this class, and this class. And I said, well, who told you to do that? I said, nobody told me to do it. I'm paying for school, college mm -hmm. study, and student loans. I said, I figure I'll take the classes I want to take. At 16. Yeah. Right then and there, uh, they told me that they had been in conversations with the School of Fine Arts for a couple of years and had been thinking about starting a new degree program for people like me that had multiple disciplines. So I am actually the founder and first graduate of the musical theater degree program at the University of Miami. And it, it went from there. Graduated magna cum laude uh, and doubled my curriculum. I minored in journalism and uh, yeah. And a couple of years later, I was on television. So I came home, was had a record out. I was 20 on Billboard with a bullet, won the Apollo, uh, was recording and writing for different recording artists. That's what I thought I was going to be doing. I thought I was going to be a recording artist. Yes. Well, you know, I, I'm glad that you left uh, so much space for us others to come in and kind of squeeze <laughs> into the, because you just, just the, the dynamism. Okay, let's 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 go. And I'm, you know, okay, you got me started really good. Thank you. Let's go okay. back a bit to okay. to, to baby Don Lewis. Baby Where was Don. baby Don Lewis born? Well, in Harlem, baby right? Baby Don was born in Brooklyn, New York. Brooklyn. Bed side, okay. my bad. Bed side, do or die. My family is from South America. So myself and my brothers, I have three brothers, were the first in our family born in the States. So my family is from Guyana. And uh, yeah, so we were the first born in this country. Um, and you know, neighborhoods that you don't, people don't expect you to aspire. You know, to talk about film and, and television and, and music. You become a nurse or a teacher or a technical worker of, of some kind, or a city worker, or a sec secretary. And all of those jobs are absolutely vital. We cannot function as a society without different people to fill different lanes. That just wasn't my lane, and my mom saw that. You know, from the time I was very, very young. Like I said, I have three brothers, uh, and I wasn't allowed to go anywhere or do anything unless my brothers took me. They right. had to with their sister. Uh, my mom races as a single mom, a uh, house uh, of domestic violence. Okay. Uh, so when she was able to get away from my dad uh, to save her life and to save us, which, not a sequitur, was one of the important reasons why I wanted to do the Tina Turner musical. Because Tina's journey, my journey was so much like hers, being raised in an environment of, of violence and your mom leaving. My mom literally left us for almost two years in order wow. to save her life. Um, and Tina's mother did the same thing. Uh, so she, but she and her mom never really seemed to reconcile. And then she in turn went into a life of domestic violence and ended up having to leaving to save herself, to save her life until right. she was in a better position 
to come back and be with her kids. A little girl in Brooklyn, always surrounded by groups of boys because of my brothers. Uh, I was always tall for my age and very athletic. I played basketball, stickball, handball, all of those things you, you do in the city. Uh, my mom looked at me one day and I was surrounded by like 10 guys. And she said, something has got to be done. I got to have my daughter out in the middle of all of these boys. So she sent me to dance class. I've been dancing since I was seven. But you went, were you went willingly though, right? I mean, she sent you there to oh, get some boys or was it something you wanted to do? I absolutely loved it. She took me to a dance recital. A friend of hers, their daughter, was right. in this dance school. So I went to the, at the, at the Brooklyn Academy of, of Music. And when the show was over, I was like, mom, I wanted, my eyes got so wide. I want to do that. That's incredible. So at seven years old, I'm riding the Brooklyn city buses by myself from Bed-Stuy all the way down to East New York to go to dance class. Can't day. do that anymore these days, can we? No. Yeah. Little kid onto a bus. Uh, the young lady, lady was a little, little older than me, so I would ride two or three stops by myself. I would have to be on the bus at a certain time, and then she would get on the bus, and then we would ride together. But even then, I was still going to elementary school, on, on the public school, on the city buses. We didn't have school buses taking you around Brooklyn at the time. Um, so that's, that's young Don started writing music. Yeah. Uh, how how would you start writing music, Don? Pardon? When did you start writing music? I, well, I started singing at four, and I started writing music. I had one of those little Magnus boards. I don't know if you remember Magnus. Yes, I do, actually, I remember them. You yeah. had the keys on one side, and then yes. you had buttons on the other side that had the chords, and you would play the melody and play mm -hmm. the... I had one of those, so I started yeah. writing songs. I think I was about seven or eight. My first song was about like seven minutes long. It was about mm -hmm. Noah and the Ark and had about 43 verses. And people indulged me in that and listened <laughs> all of my verses. And I was writing poetry. Uh, yeah. I was published in a book of up and coming young writers, mm -hmm. a compilation book, by the time I was 15. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, Don, you know, um, <laughs> Wow. You know, I've known you for a while and I've always known that you were supremely talented, but I didn't was not aware of the depth of it, nor the, the history that you just laid out. So let me just pivot a bit just and then come back again. So the name of this this conversation, this podcast is not really a podcast because we're on YouTube and I'm not on an audio platform yet is. Right. How do I know you? So in our case. Our answers could be different and I have a little story to tell you regarding okay. how I met you. So in your mind, how do I know you? Oh my God, Carl, uh, honestly, I don't even remember how we met. I know, <laughs> no, seriously, I feel like we've known each other for so long. I don't, I'm sure it was because of mutual friends and some kind of mutual mm -hmm. social yes. setting that we were all in the same place. And when you introduced yourself, I no doubt said, oh my God, that's my dad's name. Right. Because we have his name, Carl. Mm -hmm. yes. And uh, the grace of God, I mentioned him just a few minutes ago, but grace of God, my dad was able to learn to become a better person before he passed away. You so, told the story right. at Bishop Almer's retirement. That's right, that's right. That's right. I sure did. Yeah. I sure did uh, help daddy really embrace and not just show up in church, but embrace his Christianity to embrace how God can actually change you and improve yeah. you and better you and um, great to God. Yeah, That's he right. found that and Bishop Omer was a really strong part of that as well. And my mom, my mom is probably one of the most amazing people I have ever known. There has never been any reason why my mom should have been friendly to my dad or mm -hmm. even friendly to my dad but my mom never stopped praying for my father she did not deposit ugly harsh words about our dad uh into us me and my, and my brothers the one thing she did say was that when she would be really strict i would say i'm gonna go live with daddy she said fine I hope you can. <laughs> and then, and then you think about it yeah but like he like hits you he oh my god it. Yeah, you know what? I think I'm like, okay, what did you want me to do, Mom? <laughs> oh, exactly. Like, exactly. I ain't going over there. <laughs> I ain't going over there. Because <laughs> he was really charming. He's just one of the most 
colorful, wonderful, embracing people, but he had this other side that was just really unfortunate. So like I said, like gratefully, grace of God, he was able to turn that around. So that's a long answer to your question. And the answer still remains, I don't remember. Okay, so okay, I'm 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 gonna I'm gonna give you some a little bit of a uh, color. Okay, all right. all right. This is kind of the charm and the blessing of my personal career and my life uh, as an entertainer. So obviously, when the different world was on, I was a huge fan. I was one of those you know people who appointment television, Cosby, Different World, and I watched every episode. I I, I didn't miss an episode. And um, full disclosure. I had the biggest crush on you ever. And people were crushing Lisa Bonet and everybody not and Jasmine Guy, like, no, 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 her. <laughs> and you know, and so that was one part of it. So this is part one. I never knew that. So this is true. So then I but I didn't know you. So I went to this, now you may not remember this event, but it was at the um Oh, to Townhouse. Remember that that club in, in Inglewood? Yeah, okay. Down La Piera. Yeah. Yep. So I went to the Townhouse one night and Rod, uh, Howard Hewitt was singing. I remember the first time my dance. Mm -hmm. And I saw you there. And that was the first time I ever saw you in person. I'm like, <laughs> and you went and you went to your car and I actually followed you out. And I was just to say oh, hello. No. We didn't really meet. But just to say hello to you. So that's part two. So finally, here is the thing I think happened. So Atlene Hunter is a very dear friend of mine. Mm -hmm. And mine. And, yes, and one of my mentors and my directing mentors. When I direct theater, you know, I have to say that I kind of pattern my style between her and Bill Duke and my own personal style. And uh, I know you knew her, and they're just we're in the same space. But I think the thing that really clinched it was Faithful Central. Because I think that that's really what it was. I think that somehow through the machinations of Faithful Central going to church every week, maybe found ourselves in the same space. And and I had, I, I led the drama ministry there for like 10 years. Uh -huh. And so I think that through those kinds of interactions is how we actually met. Did you direct, we did a video with mm -hmm. Tracy. Tracy, I forget what it was. It was like a, a street type setting. Um, because we did it with the drama ministry and the music department. It was it was a music video, and I had just torn my Achilles tendon, and I was on crutches. And in between takes, I'm hopping around on crutches. And as soon as they said action, the crutches threw to the ground. And I was Hilarious. Like, Hilarious. And me and they were like, okay, I was like, cut, give me my crutches. <laughs> I don't think I did that one. What, what do you remember? What year no. it was? No, no, that had to be in the late 80s or probably early 90s. No, no, I, I came on uh, 2006. Oh, and no. We, and we established uh, uh, a ministry called the FCBC Repertory Company. Yeah, repertory Company, right. Yeah, and I started that, I started in 2006. I led, it, I led it from 2006 to 2016. Okay. And so, and that's when we did those panel days. I think you came in for one right. of those. So that was our ministry. So okay. that was that was kind of how I think it happened. But yeah, you, oh, I had this, it was ridiculous. Yeah, I had this huge crush on you, dog. It was crazy. So yeah, I don't want to embarrass you, nothing like that. And, you know, we old now, but this, this but, but it just shows you how, how these circles are so small. Yeah. And how you just kind of become friends. And there friends. you are. And there you are. And the thing is, it doesn't surprise me that you don't know a lot of this stuff. Because generally with my friends, I rarely, if I ever talk about business. Right, right. We talk about life, we talk about family, we talk about mutual interests, mm -hmm. we talk about fun things we can do together, we go to parties, we, we dance, we share meals, all those kinds of things. And uh, to me, that just keeps my, my personal spirit full. That, as it should be, you know what I mean? mean? And not comparing who's done what and who's been where and who knows who, I mean, there's a time and a place for that, mm -hmm. but uh, a lot of people don't know, unless you've been on the journey with me. Like mm -hmm. there's even the Howard Hewitt story. Why I was even at the townhouse with Howard is because when Jody Watley left Shalimar, mm -hmm. Solar Records had a nationwide search for the girl that was gonna place Jody Watley. So at the time, I think it was 1984, I had mm -hmm. literally 
just graduated from college, I was working as an office temp in the World Trade Center. And okay. I took a temp job so I could still go to auditions and still go to dance class and still mm -hmm. do all of those things. So it was on the radio, WBLX in the morning. Oh, yeah. Yes, Vaughn Harper's show and Pat Prescott. That was when I met Pat. Mm -hmm. uh, they announced they were going to have this talent search at this club in Midtown. So I called my job and said, you're going to have to get a temp for the temp because I'm coming today. I'm going to go on this for Shalimar. Right. So long story short, I won for New York City. And Howard Hewitt and Mickey Free were there, and we exchanged numbers. And I had on this blue suede off the shoulder mini dress and some fishnets and some high heel pumps. And I performed a song, a very original song that I had written and I won for New York. So they introduced me to Howard and Mickey afterwards and we talked and chatted and he called me fishnet. Uh, <laughs> I've been Howard for 40 years. And just as I'm yeah, sure that it was memorable for Howard though, darling. Fishnet. That's a Howard, huh? as I, I'm getting a, you know, a projected picture of this you in the fishnets. I'm sure Howard Hewitt was somewhat traumatized in a positive way by seeing that vision of you and can't, can't forget it. Can't put it out of his mind, Dawn. I get oh me, my and God. Howard, me and Howard are here. Yeah, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've been greatest friends ever since. I just, I absolutely adore him. He's such mm. a, a special human being and we've just been real genuine friends ever since then. Well, you know, I... I don't know Howard very well, but I um, have a, a, my own very brief Howard Hewitt story. Back uh, some years ago, he used to have this thing called Real Men Cook in L.A. Yes, yes. And um, I was in that one year with my chili, and Howard Hewitt was right next to me. What did he have? Oh, I don't remember. He, it was something good. He likes to cook. <laughs> it, it was something good. <laughs> I don't remember, but it was something really good. But we were right next to each other, and we had a great time just kind of fellowshipping and, and, and talking and all that at this event. So I, I want to I touch on, I think, your music a little bit more. Okay. So a lot of people don't know that you wrote the theme song to Different World. I did. I did. So how did that come about? I mean, did you write the song first, and then they brought you on as an actor? Or was it you on the show, and you wrote the no. song? How did that happen? They kind of happened at the same time, actually. Okay. Like, like I said, that was my vision. I was going to be this recording artist that was sometimes on Broadway. Mm -hmm. uh, when I was in college, I did a TV pilot. It didn't get picked up. They aired it as a Halloween special a right. couple of years, but it didn't. It was going to be. It was called the Crummy Movie Show, where the movie was so bad you would turn the channels and we were the commercials and the other sketches from right, the other right, shows. Right. So that was that was the prim, prim, premise of, of that. That didn't go. So television was never really my focus. When I graduated from college, I was still singing, still dancing. I was a session singer, writing and recording jingles and trying to get my career off the ground as a recording artist. So I had a demo tape, if you remember cassettes. I had a demo tape of my singing and songwriting and a friend of mine was working with the music supervisor of the Cosby Show and gave him my demo tape. Wow. So a year later, now I'm on the road, I'm in the national tour of the Tap Dance Kid, mm -hmm. singing and dancing with Hinton Battle, Carl Nicholas of the Nicholas Brothers. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Dulé Hill was our kid, he was 10 years old. Dulé, I was in my early 20s, so that's like my little brother. Right. Uh, and uh, Ben Harney from the original cast of Dream Girls and mm -hmm. Monica Page and Martine Allard. Okay. So I'm on the road. So I hear while I'm on the road that they're going to be having this spinoff of the Cosby show. So then I find out that it's being cast by the same casting directors that cast the Broadway tour that I'm doing. So okay. I called and said, can I please audition? Consider me. They said, no, Dawn, we love you. We love just right where you are. Ah. You're doing a great job in the show. You stay right there. Okay. And I'm like, but okay. So the, the tour ends. I've been calling the whole last three months of the tour. They're like, no, no, no. We want everyone to be Lisa's age. And my response is, well, everybody can't be a fresh freshman. I'm only right, two right. years older than she is. Somebody has to be a sophomore, something. Right, right, right. Nope. So the tour ends. I got three weeks left to unemployment. And I get a call from the casting directors. Are you still interested in auditioning? Can you come in tomorrow? Right. Yeah, sure. I will be there. Great. 
an hour after they called me, the musical director calls me and said, look, I've had this tape for about a year. Are you the same person that is singing and that wrote these songs? I said, yeah. He said, well, would you be interested in working with me on the music for this new Cosby show? Mm -hmm. I was like, yeah. And now I thought, no, no, seriously. I thought it was some friends of mine playing a trick on me because that, that just doesn't happen. He said, well, this is the premise of the show. I'll send a messenger over with some music, see what you come come up with, and I'll see you in the studio on Friday. This right. is on a Wednesday. I said, well, you don't want to meet first to see what I write? He says, no. If you wrote this stuff, you can do exactly what I need done. I'll see you in the studio on Friday. So I called the casting directors back and said, did you just call me? <laughs> they said, yeah. Is there, is there a problem? Can you not come? I said, oh, no, no, no. I'll, I'll be there. And sure enough, an hour and a half later, a messenger was at my house, dropped off this cassette. And my mind is like, what is happening right now? OK, all right. I, I need some guidance. So right. literally, if I knew nothing else from the experience that I'd already had in the industry, I knew I needed to get a contract. I needed to get representation. I didn't have an agent mm -hmm. at the time. Um, so I went through the yellow pages to try to find an attorney. Right. And I thought, oh, I studied a book, this business of music while I was in college. That was part of my degree mm -hmm. program. So I looked up who wrote this book and the lawyers actually had an office in New York city, Andy Feynman and Bill Krasilovsky. Okay. I looked them up, called them and said, you don't know me. I just graduated from college, but I just got this offer to do this thing. And I know I need some help. Do you have free legal aid? Do you have, what, mm -hmm. what, what do you have? They said, well, can you come into the office tomorrow? Just tell us what's going on. Mm -hmm. I said, okay. I went to my audition, da, 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 read, read, read my sides. And they said, okay, great. Thank you. Bye. Oh, okay. Bye. Thank you. Went to the attorney's office, ran the whole thing down to, to them. And they said, well, we will be happy to represent you. Mm -hmm. I said, okay, no, you missed the part where I said, I don't have any money. I <laughs> got out of school. I can't pay y'all. So their response was, we are really impressed with the fact that you didn't just sign something and just jump right in into anything mm -hmm. and we want to help you. So we, we will do this completely free of charge. All we ask is that when you get the opportunity, you be willing to help someone else right. and pay it forward. I've never heard that term before, wow. pay it forward. And I literally sat in these attorneys office and I cried. No one had ever done anything that amazing and that supportive for me. Right. So they negotiated my contract. They got me this unheard of deal. Um, the musical director, he shares, well, Mr. Cosby shares 50% of everything that he does. So he said, well, then we, it should be broken up into a third. And they, my attorney said, well, no. If she came up with the melody, she's written the words. She gets 50%. She, she's a 50% songwriter and you can write the music and the arrange, arrangement and Mr. Cosby can have 50% of your 50%. Wow. But Don Lewis wrote this and she will get screen credit. Her name will, will be there, etc. Unheard of, unheard of. So they, they went with it we did it. Flip to about five days later, I book the opportunity to get a screen test. And I'm telling you, when I walked into that room and before they sent me to LA, like I said, I didn't have an agent. I walked into this room and I'm the only person in the room I didn't recognize. The other ladies that I was buying for this role opposite, I'd seen in magazines, I'd seen in commercials, very, very fair skin, long hair, green eyes, a size two. And I'm looking like, yeah, yeah. what am I doing here? So I do what I do. I read the sides, I left, and I went to dance class. And I came out of dance class and about five hours later, and someone screaming, my, we've been looking for you. We have to get your agent. You have to fly to Los Angeles day after tomorrow for your screen test. And that I'm like, don't have them. Okay, I'll get back to you. So now I'm calling around to my friends that have agents and said, can you please, can they just negotiate this for me and I'll pay them for their time? Mm -hmm. You're not going to get a commission because you didn't get this. I went to an open call. Mm -hmm. I went to no representation. I have been trying for months 
to get an agent. We've all been there. Well, yeah. maybe not all of us, but enough of us. Right. Where you're sending out composites, you're sending out headshots, you're sending out all of this stuff, trying to get someone to call you back or at least have a meeting. And in all that time, I forget, I just did a Broadway show. I should be able to get an agent. No, sir, no one returned one single call. So this agent negotiated my contract. I was on a plane, flew first class for the first time in my life. Mm -hmm. Amazing. They sent limousine, took me to the studio, took me to the Sheridan Universal. And I had this, this amazing room with a view that seemed to see all of Los Angeles. Oh, and that's, and that's, that, that show sat at Radford, right? Sagan? It, it sat at Radford, CBS. We Radford. shot the pilot at Sun, Sunset Gower. Okay. Then we shot the first half of the first season up at Universal. Okay. Then we moved from U Universal to Radford. Okay. And then we stayed at CBS Radford. Yeah. So okay. I go through all of that. They send me back to New York. They say, okay, uh, you have to meet with Mr. Cosby. And if he likes you, then we go from there. Mm -hmm. So they they dressed me. Now where I lived in Brooklyn was about 10 minutes or 15 minutes from where they originally shot the Cosby show in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. Well, the casting directors, they said, we really want you to get this job. So we want you to bring some wardrobe options and meet us in Midtown at the at the office, and then we'll ride back to Brooklyn together. Okay. So I'm up all night long going through my closet putting this huge collection of clothes together, carry it in my arms on the subway from Brooklyn all the way to Midtown Manhattan. I walk into their office. They go, what you're wearing is perfect. That's great. Let's go. I say, <laughs> so we get in a taxi, go back to Brooklyn, and it's myself, uh, Tom Werner mm -hmm. from Carsey Werner, sure, and sure. Barry Hughes and Julie Moss. Got it. The cast directors. Direct right. Directors, right. So we're in the dressing room with Bill. He's hanging up on a call. He rolls, he's in a chair that has wheels on it. He rolls over to us where we're sitting. And I'm sitting, I got my sides in my hand and I'm ready to give my best audition for Mr. Cosby. And they say, Bill, before we get started, did you get to listen to the song? He goes, oh yeah, the song is great. The song is perfect. Girl's voice is fantastic. And she, she captures the whole thing. It's absolutely great. I couldn't be happier. And I'm sitting there like, they don't know that that's me. So I, I raised my hand and they said, yes. I said, well, I just wanted to say thank you. They said, for what? I said, that you like the song. I'm really glad you like the song. That's me. I'm I'm the girl. And they look at me like, what? And Bill just starts laughing. He's like, eh, 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 eh. <laughs> it wasn't until that moment that they realized I was the same person that they were talking about who had done the music. So now they're talking almost 15 minutes. We could do this to her hair and see the way she's wow, dressed now. I want her to look wow. like that and this and that and this and that. So I'm sitting there and I raised my hand again. They said, yeah. I said, does this mean I have the job? They said, well, what do you think we've been talking about for the last 15 minutes? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to sit here and I'm just going to be quiet. I'll <laughs> give, give us a minute and um, you know, uh, somebody will come out. So I left the dressing room and I'm sitting there. You know how you scream and nothing comes out of your mouth? Right, I'm right. Like, oh so Tom Warner comes out and says, congratulations. I said, thank you so much. He said, you OK? I said, yeah, but I need to use your phone. I got to call my mother. <laughs> he me into his office. He gets me an outside line. And I said, look, I don't want to be weird or anything. But before I call her, would you please pray with me? Wow. And Tom looked at me. I said, I'd be happy to. So we sat there and prayed together. I couldn't believe it. So I called my mom. My mom was an OR technician at the time. Mm -hmm. She always wanted to be a surgeon, but women surgeons, especially women of color, mm -hmm. were not encouraged or supported back in that, that mm -hmm. day. So she's the one who assisted sur surgeons mm -hmm. in the operating room. So I'm calling my mother. And the nurse answers, she said, well, Dawn, she's in surgery right now. I said, I don't care. You got to get my mom uh, out here right uh, now. So my mom thinks there's something wrong. So she comes right. to the phone. Yes, yes, Didi, did what did I said, Mom, I got the job. Not only did I get the job, but they also love the song that I wrote. It's going to be on the show. I'm going to be in the show. I said, I don't think they're going to let, let me sing it now that they know I'm the same person. Uh, they did say something about that, but uh, so that's why I ended up not singing 
the theme song because they thought that was just that was too much attention too much. on me and right. it wasn't my show. No, right. Um, so my mom is like, thank you, Jesus, oh Father, me, oh Father, Father, blessings. And so she's carrying on in the in the hospital. I'm crying in Tom's office. And two days later, I was back on a plane back in LA. Me and Mar Marissa Tomei and Lisa, and we're shooting the pilot. And we shot, we worked for about uh, maybe like six weeks. Mm -hmm. And then the production shut, shut down. We had a black exec producer by the, a man by the name of George Crosby, mm -hmm. and they replaced George. We were shut down for about a month. They replaced George and brought in Ann Beats. Ann Beats, right. And then Ann Beats came in, and she's the one who brought in the Whitley character and and Dwayne Wayne and and Ron and Millie, who was. So they weren't in the they weren't in the pilot then. Well, no. What what happened was when we originally shot, no. So what they did in order to salvage the episodes we had already shot, they reshot certain scenes to include those cast members in them. So it looked like we were all there together okay. from the very beginning. But yeah, that was that was how the show started. That is a great story. Um, I've never heard it before. Uh -huh. So I think it's going to be a treat for for my my people to hear it because I've never heard that. So listen, I'm going to ask you a couple more things. I want to touch on your philanthropy as well, but I want to ask you just a cold question. I want you to look at the screen. What about this? Can you tell Hang me a bit about that experience? Hang with Mr. Cooper think, recording that, that theme theme song. That was nope. a lot of fun. That was a funky theme song. It was. Um, it ended up being, uh, after all was said and done, the show was really funny. The show was really good. The show was really a challenge to work on. Okay. It really was a challenge to work on. And the biggest reason I was there was because I was ready to move on from a different world. Mm -hmm. uh, a different world started with a cast of three. And by the time I left, it was a cast of 14 where they really only wrote for two P people. Right, right. right. Um, it was an insanely talented group of people. But as an, as an actor, it's like, this, um, this is not doing anything. Mm -hmm. I, I want more out of my career. I want to do more. I want to participate more. While I was doing the show, I had started doing voiceover work. I yeah. was still doing music. I was writing and producing for different recording artists. Um, I had recorded with Patrice Russian, Quincy Jones. I won a Grammy working on the Handles Messiah project with Quincy Jones and Murphy. Was that the one um, with all these different artists on it, like Yellow Jackets and mm -hmm. Al Jarreau? Mm -hmm. Was Al Jarreau on that, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, I have that. I saw, love that CD, especially around yeah. Christmas. It was part of my Christmas collection. There you go. There yeah, you go. I, love that. I was yeah. doing that, writing and producing with Grover Washington Jr. and Nancy Wilson wow. and Everett Hart. I mean, that's what I was doing because I really wasn't doing much on the show. And this was more of the fullness of who I am as, as an artist. And uh, every record label I went to have a meeting with would put out some kind of press release saying I was signed with them. When I wasn't signed with them, we had just had a meeting. And so it just became this endless circle of, um, it didn't look like that vision for myself was going to manifest. But as far as doing concerts and singing on other folks' projects, I was still doing that. And I still do 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 that to this to, to this day. And, so and voiceover and animation as well. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Absolutely. My very first voiceover gig was Kid and Play's cart cartoon. Okay. And I played one of their, uh, one, one of their partners in crime in their in their little group dance music group, uh, Suzanne DePat got me that opportunity. Okay. Um, so I had been trying, quite honestly, to get out of my contract of a different world since the third season. Really? And they would not let yeah, they would not let let me go. They said, "Nope, the fans love you. You're an integral part of the show." I said, "Yeah, but you guys aren't writing for me." I'm sitting in my dressing room. I walk in the room and give. Punch punchlines. You dress me like my my mom. I'm the I'm younger than two thirds of the cast. I'm just taller than everybody. But y'all are playing me like I'm some kind of old woman. I say, like, can I please? I mean, either write something else or just let let me go. And they wouldn't. 
So finally, at the end of the fifth season, I went to them again and said, please, just please let me go. And they said, all right, we will let, let you go if you come back with another contract opportunity. And there were only two weeks left of pilot season. So I honestly don't think they expected me to be able to get anything. Right. And within a few days, I got offered hanging with Mr. Cooper. So I was like, okay, can I go now? So you left, <laughs> so you left, you left different world while I'm still on the air. Oh yeah. I wasn't there the final C season. I was there C seasons one through five. Wow, I don't remember that, but I, you know, I do remember you not getting a lot of screen, you know, now that you mention it, that's exactly what you would do. You walk in and deliver a punchline and mm -hmm. you walk out. You, you mm -hmm. know what? That's easy money, but it's not very f fulfilling creatively, huh? No, I mean, no. So, and I had heard rumblings that the Cosby show was going to be canceled mm -hmm. that following season. So I said, okay. The one thing I don't want is that they cancel Cosby. The network was never very supportive of us or our show. Yes. If you remember back in that time, we didn't have any print ads, we didn't have billboards, we didn't have the hour long special, the cast of A Different World Goes to Europe. Uh, we didn't have commercials, but the fans absolutely loved and supported our they show. Did. Did. So they did. They did. there was no doubt in my mind that once the Cosby, that once Mr. Cosby's deal was done, they were gonna let us go exactly as well which is exactly what happened. We had one year after the Cosby show was canceled before A Different World was canceled, even though it was so successful for them. Mm. They didn't want to do it. So what I didn't want was to be unemployed at the same time as the other 14 principals. No. <laughs> yes, yes, I said, yes. let me go now. <laughs> so I went over to, over to Cooper and um, it, was, it was a battle. It was a battle. Uh, it was a show about three young people of color, but the creative team was- They were white. They were all white, right. primarily men. Mm -hmm. uh, a few episodes in, they brought in Yvette Lee Bowser. They mm -hmm. brought in one other black writing team, but it was a battle every week about what is insulting to black people and what we don't want to be seen doing or saying. And we had a director early on that never read scripts, would come to the set referring to Mark as the dumb nigga on the set. What is he gonna out loud? Yeah, it was it was it was not lovely. It wasn't. And um, yeah, so I was like, you know what? I don't know that I wanna be here either. And again, they did not want to let me go. They said, nope, you're one of the reasons everybody watches the show. We have the oh, highest think, yeah. series on any network. And then Bernie Mac called me, wanted me to play his wife in his new series. And um, I said, look, I have this opportunity. And y'all, please, you, you have every right to do whatever show it is you want to do. But just, you know, go ahead and just let me, nope, 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 nope. So I had to pass on Bernie's show and one other show. And then the day before Upfront, I got a call from one of the producers and said, you know what? We've decided to go in a different direction. So your character won't be coming back. And that's how they let, let, let me go from hanging with Mr. Cooper. They made sure I did not have another job to go to so that I would not be competition for them to have to explain why I was no longer on their show. And uh, then people were asking, but she was so good, what happened? So now they had to come up with a reason. Mm -hmm. So now you go down that uh, unfortunate road in Hollywood that sometimes happens where when people don't know what else to say or don't want to take the onus for what's happening, they put the blame elsewhere. So Carl, you've known me for decades. Yeah. For decades. Their take was Dawn, was hard to work with on the set. She would curse pee people out, et cetera. Et cetera. Have you ever heard me say a curse word? Never, not, yet, not once. That's not who I am. I was the person that wanted to pray together, bring the ensemble cast in, make sure they got introduced when we got in, introduced to the studio audience and uh, all those kinds of things. And um, that was what they said about me to justify their, uh, yeah. Whatever. So, that was, that was very, very hard to deal with. And it cost me some years. It cost me some work because this reputation gets circulated and repeated by people that I'd never met, never worked with, but felt entirely comfortable spreading gossip 
And then slowly, you know, you start to get hired because, you know, you show up and people say, well, she really is the best person for the job. So praise God for that. Praise God for perseverance and for commitment to just being the best person that I can possibly be. And you show up on set and people pull you aside and go, you know, you're not at all what I expected. So what did you expect? I said, well, I heard you were difficult and, and mean and this. You're like, you're one of the easiest people to work with. You're so nice. You're so prepared. You're so kind to everyone. And that's, I said, I don't know what to tell you. So, you know, slowly but surely, the truth went out. And uh, like I said, grace of God, he has kept me sustained. He has kept me working. He has opened more doors for me than I ever could have envisioned for my, myself. And, uh, you know, I'm grateful. I really am grateful. Well, God is the ultimate provider and opens doors. And so, mm -hmm. you know, men do things and block, but God knocks those blocks down mm -hmm. and creates other opportunities. And that's exactly what you've experienced. And I've experienced that as, as well in my business. So yeah. last thing I want you to talk about, I'm gonna put this on the screen. I want you to tell me about this. Here it goes. Okay. Oh, New Day yes. the New Day Foundation. Well, the New Day Foundation is basically the formalization of work that I've been doing ever since I was a kid. And that's doing what I can to speak positively into the lives of children. Because as I mentioned before, that's how I came to be the person that I am today. The community that I was raised in, even within my own family, it was not encouraged to be creative, to be spontaneous, to be in the arts. Um, certain very religious people, even in my family, would tell me to my seven-year-old face that, you know, you stay in this environment, you're going to go straight to hell. Oh, and yeah going to use you because that's what this environment provides. Not, nothing good comes out of this environment. But my mom always said to me, Dawn, the gifts you have are only blessings because God blessed you with them to sing, to dance, to act. And you can be a light. You, you can be the light that walks the Lord into any room. So don't receive that. You just keep doing what you need to do to be excellent. So between mm -hmm. my mom, and my grandmother, and uh, several of my teachers, when I was coming up in school, they just kept pouring positivity in, into me. So I came into the habit that when I graduated from elementary school, I would go back to the elementary school to give them updates. And I was bullied a lot when I was in school for different reasons, because it's never been cool to be a smart kid. Mm. It's never been cool to be, uh, you know, you get called teacher's pet and all of those kinds of things. So the short of the long story is I was in the habit high school, college, all of that was to go back to where I had come from and give my teachers updates and thank them for speaking positivity into my life. And while I was there, they would invariably ask me to speak to the class mm -hmm. and say, well, tell them what it's like, that you used to go to school here and now, now you're in high school, now you're in college, now you're a professional performer. So as was my habit, while I was doing a different world, I went back to music and art. Mm -hmm to talk to my teachers. Only this time I walked into the lobby and I am mobbed. Like, oh my God, it's Delisa. And, and Delisa. <laughs> Swarm me into the lobby. They had to send security to get me out of the lobby, take me to the principal's office where they made an announcement. We need you to clear the hallways. We need you to go to your class. This is a hazard. This Lewis will come and see you. Just We just need you to go back to your classroom. So they added a couple of hours to, to the school day for me to literally go to each and every class and speak to them because in an environment like that, I was living everyone's dream as a professional artist. And they had questions and they wanted in information. And that was when it clicked for me that up until this point, I had been doing that because it blessed me, mm. it brought me joy. But now I learned I actually have something to offer someone else that might be encouraging for them, that might, you know, answer some questions for them as they make their own life choices. So that's what I started doing, doing master classes and mentorship programs all across the country, overseas, as far away as, you know, London and in Italy, et cetera, when I was, whenever I was somewhere working or filming. So maybe about eight, eight years ago, I wanted to take my programs nationally. 
and have them to be a bit more organized because until then I was doing everything out of my own pocket right. or whatever school would bring me in as a workshop movie leader or to lead a master class, et cetera. So I was told that, you know, while a lot of people like me and I've shown up for different organizations over the years, like the UNCF, um, the, the United Nations, American Heart Association, et cetera, that they couldn't just give me money. I had to form a nonprofit. So I formed the A New Day Foundation. Um, it's a play on my name, Dawn, A New Day. Right, and right. that where you were yesterday is not where you need to be today, nor where you need to end up tomorrow. So we want to be a new day of opportunity and support towards you becoming your best self. So we have programs for teen girls called Sisters Hangout and teen boys called Mentors, M-E-N, capital T-O-R-S. Mm -hmm. That's for men talking of relevant situations. And we give them well, what we call experiences every quarter where we introduce them to different cultural and career opportunities that they don't necessarily get exposed to. We've done everything from taking them into the recording studio and teaching them how to make and produce their own animation video game projects to coding workshops for girls, to camping, to the build picket rodeo, all the way down to city hall so they can see how government works. Uh, this summer, we're gonna be doing a program, I believe with the NBA. Mm -hmm. and their mentors and then annually we do a conference called focused and fit for a different world fit which stands for financially and technologically informed and we hold on a college campus every year and it focuses on financial literacy and technology we also give them workshops in health and wellness making healthy choices as a young adult as well as motivation, activation, skill set, management. Now that you've got all this great inf information, how do you apply it so that you actually get a positive result? So it's for high school juniors and seniors and college freshmen and sophomores. And this is all ongoing. This is all ongoing. We just had our conference a few weeks ago. Wow. We had it on the USD campus. We give out anywhere from six to 12 scholarships of $2,000 each and a new computer. Uh, for the high school students, they get to bring their parents. So we have workshops for the parents as well so that that whole household goes home informed about how to get their young person to and through college. And most of them, their kids, you have more than one that's gonna be on this path. So now you've got information that can prepare you and set you up better for your next child or for your niece or nephew or for someone else in your community. And we've been doing this now for, we just had our sixth conference. So in the six years, we've given away well over $200,000 in wow. scholarship and computers and music equipment, et cetera. So yeah, that's the A New Day Foundation. And everything we do, we do free of charge. So all of our fund fundraising goes towards financing these programs. So when we make it available, all you have to do is show up. All Don, you have to do Don, I'm gonna tell you, that is awesome. That is awesome. And it's so important, vitally important to give back to our youth. And then in your case, you know, you have a national nonprofit, but you went back to your home school yeah. and, spoke, and spoke life into those, those kids where you came up. And that's so, so important. So I really applaud you for that. And I wanted to really get into that. And I even learned a lot more than I thought I was gonna learn about this. And so I, I want you to hopefully, well, you can text me any websites or anything I need to know so that people can can, can okay. contribute it's, or can make a big part or whatever. It's, they can donate right there on the site. It's www.anewdayfoundation.net. So you can either donate right there. The mailing address is there. If, if you want to send us um, a, a, a check or write us for any information. Yeah. So we try to, like I said, we try to do what, what we can to make it as easy as possible. But it's more than a notion. I'm not going to lie. Hey, I've got 18 jobs. It's nah. <laughs> yes, yes. And that, that's your, that's your South American roots. That's, that's, your, that's your heritage at work right there with all these things you're, you're doing. For sure. Wow. <laughs> so, Don, I want to thank you for being a part of this effort, for coming on to my conversation series, How Do I Know You? You are as lovely as always, and I'm glad to be able to get to know you even more. Yeah, and, yeah. And I, what I have known over the last couple, couple of decades that we've known each other. Thank you so much uh, for 
caring enough and inviting me to be here. I always enjoy talking to you, you and your your beautiful wife and <laughs> so many wonderful, no, seriously, so much love and peace and gems and pearls of, of wisdom and contentment and and hope that you guys provide in, in your in your postings and different things like that. It's just really, really beautiful. It really is. It's a pleasure to know you and call you my, my friend. It really yes. is. Ditto, ditto, several times over, my dear. <laughs> so, like, enjoy your event tonight. Thank you. And uh, thank you for being here, Dawn. Peace. Peace and blessings. Okay, you too. Bye. Bye. All right, there she goes. Wow. All I can say is, wow, Dawn Lewis is the true business. When we were, when I was re 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 searching Dawn Lewis, I said to myself, this lady here is a powerhouse beyond compare, and now you see it for yourself. So, another edition of How Do I Know You? Thanks for being here. Peace.